Today, with the stroke of a pen, our laws will catch up with our future. We will help to create an open marketplace where competition and innovation can move as quick as light. The internet can be fun. Internet 1.0, availability and connectivity, you know, really anywhere, was the objective. Most enterprise networks, before the advent of pervasive connectivity to the internet, they were networks in a box. Inside my network, I trust everything. Outside the network, it's the internet, I can connect to it. Security was, was not contemplated in the underlying connectivity architecture at all. The internet itself, as robust as it was designed to be, is actually quite a fragile system. And we put this really powerful engine in that enables commerce and transactions and financial exchanges of all sorts. But it was an afterthought to introduce the braking system. August 17, 1996, we have the honor at the Department of Justice being the first website that was hacked. I'll never forget that because it was the naked body of Jennifer Anistead with the head of Janet Reno. My team immediately took the website offline. That particular hack really was a foreboding event. Hacking was only going to accelerate. The happiest day in my life was two weeks later because the CIA got hacked after us. Hacking is hard, but ransomware is relatively easy because most people are bad at security. It is an attack against your rationality and your emotions. Ransomware is you got got. It embarrasses you. You have to tell every single one of your clients, hey, by the way, someone broke into your house and put padlocks on all of it and child-proofed it and you're the child. Ransomware is a new type of warfare. If you look at the targets, citizens, finance, it's affecting culture, it's affecting a nation's way of life. We have a problem in the US in that we are designed to win the wars of the 20th century. Unfortunately for us, the Russians have figured this out. When an organization comes and shuts down one of our pipelines, that was an attack on our national sovereignty. Why build aircraft carriers and physical weapon systems these days when a group of highly skilled cyber attackers can gain access to the off switch? Back in the day, of course, you had to be a sophisticated cyber actor, but no longer. You and I right now can go on YouTube and find a video about how to use the tools that they use. When was the last time we actually saw crime rise to this level? Sometimes the only way to find a ransomware gang is to follow the money. Today, these ransomware actors spend a lot of time trying to move that money across the digital blockchain. You can see who they do business with, who calls who, who pays who, who answers to who. You literally follow the money. My name is Tom Kellerman. In 2020, I was appointed to the Cybercrime Investigations Advisory Board for the United States Secret Service. The evolution of the cybercrime community began in basically 1995. The central banking community of the world and the major financial institutions of the world moved to electronic finance. There was no longer a delay in when a payment would arrive at another institution, which allowed for greater liquidity in the markets. This is when money became digital. The Soviet Union, as we have known it for most of the 20th century, is breaking up now. This was compounded by a functional reality that you had a lot of computer scientists that used to be employed by the Soviet bloc who were unemployed because the Soviet Union collapsed. And these folks harnessed their own skill sets to then bypass the encryption and the solutions employed by the banks to begin the largest theft in the history of the world, cybercrime. A lot of these gangs were focused on just stealing information, getting credit card numbers, getting names and email addresses to sell for advertisement lists and things like that, or spam lists. Uh, but ransomware, it really changed things. If you go back through the history of mankind, people have been extorting ransoms out of others for things of value that they wanted, whether it was a person or a thing. Well, what's valuable in today's economy? Data. Everything from the transactions that we're engaging in to our personal records. And so it presents a really unique opportunity for illicit actors to lock up some of those things that we hold most valuable and then extort it for payments. All cybercrime at its core is about unauthorized access. But in terms of using that access to prevent 
the organization from being able to function and to hold as hostage, that has been a relatively recent phenomenon. The ransom request is literally a price offer. It makes you feel like you are defenseless and from a rational perspective, something that you have to engage in. Because in ransomware, hackers want to make themselves look bigger and more established. It's really hard to fight back when there's a group of people. And when you look like you're a highly well-regarded organization that's trustworthy, that causes a paralysis. They find a note on their machine, everything is encrypted, and they have a little Word doc that says, hello, you have been hacked by XYZ. They tell you what it costs to get your data back. They explain the services that you will be provided. They tell you for all questions, direct them here. They want to be someone that makes you feel as though you're going to be trusted and your money will be in a safe place. Many of the viewers of this program would say, why would they want to hack to me? But they forget something. It's about degrees of separation. The adversary will go after you because you have this new customer that's a government agency, whether it be state, local, or federal. The adversary will target you because you have a partnership with a big bank. As an individual, it's about who you know. You are your data. So these people are committing kidnapping against your digital selves, and they're able to do it and exploit that for a lot of money. With the advent of cryptocurrency, it offers unique opportunity for these actors to transfer value between themselves and across borders with speed that was not previously possible. This is an official statement that has been released, and it starts with Happy Friday, everyone. There was a recent attempt to expose our infrastructure by a cybersecurity firm. It gets boring when you only deal with chimpanzees whose top capabilities are scraping forums. We've made around 30 million at least. <laughs> Sucks this Twitter hobos. My name is Yelisi Bogoslavsky. I investigate the dark web, primarily ransomware groups, and try to develop methodology of disrupting these groups. When we talk about cyber criminals, it's important to understand that most of those people are just usual people that at some point started to do something wrong. Traditionally, you had three friends trying to code the entire ransomware to prepare the entire backend infrastructure, which means setting up servers, configuring things, exploiting victims, and launching their attacks. So that didn't scale. It was not the model that would scale. Ever since the recession of 2008, the cybercrime community and these cartels began to modernize their operations, their organizational structures, become more sophisticated in how they deliver services. They feel like they are running a business just like any other legitimate security business. Obviously, they're not, they're thieves, but ransomware is such a complex operation now that one person couldn't do it all. If I am a novice bad guy, I don't want to build out a whole ransomware infrastructure. So what I do is I choose one of these ransomware groups and I say, hey, I want to sign up for your ransomware as a service. So you put down a deposit, they give you your own executable. So if you're successful, they handle the negotiation, they accept the Bitcoin, and then they give you your cut. You just have to focus on finding victims and encrypting as many as possible. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. They can just access that service and provide a fee, and they all have this already set up. For them, it's already a business. It's a crime as a service. A ransomware developer is the person or the group of persons that are creating the virus, the tool that once it reaches your computer, encrypts every file. You have the negotiator, people calling the victims who can handle the negotiation. You have a whole industry of what we call initial access brokers, the ones who get the access to the organizations and then turn around and sell it to the ransomware groups. You have the money launderers. They do the exchanges for you to get that money and legitimately use it. Then you have all of what they call the affiliates. They are the ones carrying out the attack with spam, phishing, exploitation, doesn't really matter. So it's a very well organized underground world. A recent attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment could be the most disastrous computer hacking in Hollywood history. The attackers, likely working on behalf of a nation state, are accountable for several of the most harmful attacks in history, including the attack at Sony Pictures, the cyber heist of Bangladesh Bank, and the creation of the WannaCry ransomware. For a worldwide organization like Sony, 
uh, to be locked down, have films leaked that weren't even released, to have emails released that were very sensitive that brought down careers. The impact of it lasted years after, and the problem keeps just getting worse. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for it getting worse. One of the main reasons is a lot of simple-to-use tools have just gotten into the hands of uh, different gangs that have done traditional cybersecurity scams before. You are also seeing uh, state players starting to get involved as well. My name's Jim Lewis. I spent a long time working for the federal government agencies. War between great powers has changed because of technology and largely because of cyber technologies. There's a close connection that they take advantage of by using cyber criminals as proxies, a useful tool. They lean heavily on the cyber crime cartels that exist within their sovereign boundaries and use them as national assets, so long as they abide by the three rules. You don't hit anything on the sovereign territory of the government that's protecting you. When you have access to a system that could be useful to the intelligence services, you share it. And when called upon to be patriotic, we will challenge you to attack specific target sets. Those three rules allow for the major cybercrime cartels, many of which are behind the ransomware being launched against U.S. companies and citizens on a regular basis. That's how they achieve untouchable status. We're at a crossroad. Do we say it's purely crime, or do we say that there is a, a broader national security interest at stake here? There's a ransomware attack somewhere in the world every 11 seconds. The cost of this, and this is simply the immediate cost of ransomware, is in the order of $20 billion over 2021. So long as we have systems that can run code, we're going to have bad people attacking and exploiting those systems. And they're going to come up with more creative and inventive ways of succeeding in their job. And we're going to come up with more creative and inventive ways of succeeding in our job. The point here is to try to shift the balance of power. The point is to try to change the economics of it to where it becomes more attractive to a cyber attacker to use their skills for good rather than for bad make the cost of what it is that they're trying to do so great that they realize that they would probably have a better time just getting a job as a developer at a legitimate company rather than trying to be a cyber criminal. The issue is that you can become an IT guy and make 2,000 a month, or you can use exactly the same skill and do 20,000 a month in a ransomware gang. With Civil War, with revolution and with societies going to the same loop of corruption. They essentially try to use cybercrime as a competitive advantage in life. And there are only two types of people in cybercrime, those who are paranoid and those who are dead. You adapt to that both mentally and physically pretty quick.